to minister into your life. Mm -hmm. And so tonight, um, if you do have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3. And go ahead and hold, hold your place right there. Exodus chapter number 3. <clears throat> and um, tonight we are going to continue on, on a series that has to do with what can hinder a church, what can hinder a church, and knowing that you and I, that we are the church, and so what, what sorts of things can hinder um, when we assemble together, the, the things that we are desiring to achieve, whether it be um, j just God moving, God, God saving people, God bringing breakthroughs, God bringing deliverances, God utilizing the church uh, for what it's been placed in the inner city for. What, what sorts of things can hinder this movement that we call the church or the body of Christ? And so tonight, um, the topic that I want to look at with you tonight is simply entitled excuses how many of you have ever known people that have an excuse for everything no matter what it is you know there's there's an excuse for everything instead of just simply seeing whatever that hand and looking for an opportunity to maybe perhaps make it better or or change the circumstance rather than do that their, their first position is to give you an excuse so tonight there's an old secular proverb that goes like this if you don't want to do something one excuse is as good as another in other words if you're not doing something, it really doesn't matter why. No, no excuse is relevant. I want to look at a couple of excuses that seem to be very common. Uh, a couple of things that people will, will use at their own disposal. Um, and then in just a few moments here, I just want to do kind of an introduction to what we're going to talk about. And then we'll get into Exodus chapter 4 and kind of go through the life of Moses and, and look at some of the excuses he had and, uh, and perhaps maybe look at our own lives and say, um, what sort of excuses am I bringing that are actually bringing a hindrance um, to the advancement of God's kingdom? And so every one of us has been called um, to be a, a, a very important piece in advancing God's kingdom, whether you understand that, whether you believe that or not, you matter. You count. Um, you you are you are important. Um, you 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 uh, you know you have a, a place, a position um, that God has put you in, and you matter for advancing God's kingdom. But what sort of excuses do you dig up from your own life to say why you can't accomplish or do? what God has called you to do. And, and I believe that you're going to find that a lot of <coughs> things in Moses' life are relevant to the times that we're living here today. Um, one excuse that a lot of people um, use is, I don't have enough time. That's, that's an excuse that many people will use um, for why um, they can't do what God has called them to do. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about um, overworking yourself or getting yourself involved in every single ministry um, because you won't have enough time for that. You'll, you'll burn yourself out. Thank you, brother. But I'm talking about when you clearly hear what God has called you to do, um, but your excuse to the Lord is I don't have enough time. And so extra time like money rarely just materializes itself out of thin hair. We have to work for it. Finding creative time is a struggle for you. Consider getting proactive about carving it out and doing the most important things first. 
And so a lot of times if, if, we, if we look at, <coughs> at our lives and, and we use the excuse that, you know, I just don't have enough time, if you would really maybe document or journal um, what you do during the day, I'm sure that you can find there's a lot, of, a lot of time that can be replaced with some things that you probably don't have to do. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that, that really don't matter, that aren't really that important. And I'll tell you, it's just like if you were to keep a food journal, right? And you're trying to lose weight, you're wondering, man, why am I losing weight? But when you're writing in your food journal, you're like, man, I, I really ate all that today? You know? And it's the same with time. Like, like sometimes we waste so much time, you know, two hours here and three hours there, and, you know, watching, just watching TV or, or doing nothing. Or, or even, I, I would even dare to say this, look at the screen time that you spend on your phone, because your phone will tell you. Your phone will tell you how much time this week you spent on it. And so you can look at the end of the week, and if your excuse is, uh, you know what, I just don't have enough time, but you spent 11 hours on your phone this week, then perhaps it's just, uh, I don't even know where I'm going with this or why this is not coming out right here, but it's coming out. And so, and so maybe perhaps um, you, you need to carve that time out of there. Some people will use the excuses, I'm, I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid the excuse that I have is, is I'm, I'm not sure if I'll be successful. I'm, I'm not sure if I'll be able to accomplish uh, uh, what it is that I want to pursue. If we really push ourselves, we will fail more than we'll succeed. Did you hear what I said? If we really push ourselves, and that's a good thing, if you really push the limit, you will actually fail more than you succeed. But that's how we gain experience. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. The greater failure is to never risk failure at all. Listen to what this lady says. If you do only what you know and you do it very, very well, Chances are that you won't fail. You'll just stagnate. And your work will get less and less interesting. And that alone is failure by definition. So some people are, 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 are afraid. Um, and that's the excuse. You know, I, I don't know. And we're going to find in Moses' life that that was one of his excuses. Someone once said, excuses are tools of the incompetent, and those who specialize in them seldom go far. Benjamin Franklin is quoted saying, he that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. And so we're looking to perhaps nudge us, push us, provoke us, um, bring us to a place that maybe... Maybe up to today, maybe perhaps, you know, in the back of your mind, um, there's some things that, that God's been pressing uh, upon you. And, and, and perhaps, you know, you've been contemplating uh, stepping out and doing something, maybe a little bit more than what you're doing now. But in the back of your mind, you have all of these excuses as to why you can't do that. Well, I'm hoping that perhaps tonight that through God's word, um, that you will be encouraged, that you will be edified, that you will be willing to step out. Um, and you will be able to come to a place where you're, you're able to, to get rid of any excuses that you may have. Jeremiah in the book, and we're not going to be there. That's not our text today. But I just want to share in Jeremiah chapter number one. Um, you know, Jeremiah had a task before him um, that he had to go out. And he was talking about, but I'm young, I'm but a youth, right? And, and, and he was kind of concerned with his age. And you know what the Lord tells him? He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And so Jeremiah is there and he's trying to give excuses as to why he can't do, accomplish, or walk in the calling that God had for his life. And yet God would say, man, I knew you. I formed you in the womb. And so tonight, I want you to... <coughs> Turn with me, I believe we should already be there, to the book of Exodus, chapter number 4, verses number 1 through 5. Um, some people have excuses in life as to why they're at where they are, why they're in the situation they're in, um, perhaps in a career situation, right? Some people were like, man, you know what, you just don't know, this is the situation I'm in. 
Well, you know what? Those are all excuses. If you really want to do something more, step out and do it. Stop, stop. You know, I, I hear guys all the time tell me, you know, I'm going to get my contractor's license. I'm like, well, then get it. Stop talking. I've heard, I, guys have been around me three, four years talking about they're going to get their contract. You know, I think, stop talking about it. Just do it. You, you have all these excuses why you, why, why you can't do it. Just go do it. Take the test. Accomplish it. People have all these excuses for their broken relationships, right? Why, why things are going wrong, you know, in their marriages, in their homes, in their relationships. And these are all excuses because when we come to Jesus Christ, we're a new creation. We begin walking according to the Word of God, according to what God teaches us. And so excuses we're going to find here in the Word of God are something that have been around since the beginning of time. And so Exodus chapter number 4, and I'm going to start, I, I did tell you to turn to Exodus 3, but I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. And then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand, and he caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Let's pray tonight. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, um, we come here in your presence, we gather um, anticipating that your Holy Spirit is going to move, that he is going to speak ever so clearly into our hearts tonight, that we are going to hear the voice of God through the pages of Scripture. Lord, we ask that tonight that you would move in our hearts, that, that, that we would have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying tonight, so that we can step out of our comfort zones, removing every and any excuse that we may have for why we can't accomplish what it is you've called us to accomplish. And so, Lord, we ask you tonight that you would have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, when God appears to Moses in the book of Exodus here that <coughs> we're going to be talking about, Moses, of course, you know, had previously been in Egypt, and then he leaves Egypt, and now here he is after Another 40 years, a total of 80 years has gone by, and Moses is there, and, and he begins to see a bush that's on fire, and it's burning before him. And as Moses is there, and he's looking at this, and he begins to turn towards it, he hears a voice coming from the burning bush, and the voice is calling on him and saying, Moses, Moses. And so what the voice is saying is it's God literally speaking to Moses and telling him, Moses, I have a plan for your life. I have a purpose for your life. And so when we come to the house of God, when we come to the kingdom of God, immediately we are taught as men and women of God that God hasn't called us to be spectators. And I know you've heard that a hundred times. I know you, you, you hear it very often because we truly believe in the call of God on an individual's life. Now, not every one of us has been called to be a pastor, is going to be sent out to take a city, you know. Um, not everybody is going to be called to perhaps be an evangelist or be a worship leader. All these, there's so many different callings, but we have all been called in one way or another to advance God's kingdom. And so in Exodus chapter number 3, verse number 11, we find the first excuse that Moses would bring as God comes before him. Listen to what verse 11 says. God is speaking to Moses in chapter number 3 up to verse number 11. And he says, listen, Moses, I have heard the cry of my people amongst the Egyptians. They have been oppressed. They have been tormented. I have heard their cry. And I am calling you because you will be their deliverer. And Moses' first excuse, his first response to the call of God in his life is, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Now, if you understand the life of Moses, you know that as, as he was born to a Hebrew woman that at that time that they were destroying the males, the young children. And so 
Moses' mother would put him in this makeshift little bassinet boat and put him into the river and allow him to float down. And so there was a lot of baggage that Moses would carry in his life. There had to have been some, some rejection. There, there had to have been some, maybe perhaps, I know my mom may have done it for good reasons, but nonetheless, I was raised in Pharaoh's palace. And even from there, you know, as Moses is raised in this place, he still knew that he had a biological mother. But yet here I am being raised in this circumstance. And so, you know, his, his thought is, you know, I, I don't have the greatest confidence in who I am. And so sometimes based on our upbringing or based on where we were born into or based on how we're, we were treated as children, sometimes we lack confidence in our life. Sometimes we don't have self-esteem. And so when God comes and he begins to speak into your life and, and God begins to say, you know what, I want to use you. And many times based on what has taken place in our life and, 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 and all of these bad memories perhaps we have in our childhood or in our teenage years. And then in the back of our mind, you know, you may be able to come and stand before a group of people being nervous as can be and, and, and trying your best to be used by God, but in the back of your mind, the enemy is lying to you, and he's saying, who do you think you are? Do you really think that you can go and speak God's word? Do you really think you have the right? Don't you remember who you are? Don't you remember that they didn't want you? Don't you remember that you were rejected? Don't you remember you never really truly had a place to call home? And so all these things would weigh upon Moses. And so when God calls him, his first response to God is, Who am I? Why would you choose me? And so we have to come to the understanding that God knows what he's doing. That when you come to the Lord, you ought to. Come to the place where you truly understand that you are a new creation. You may not have any control of the circumstances of the past. But as you stand before God today, that God has anointed you and ordained you so that you can be used to advance the kingdom of heaven. Moses was but a lowly shepherd at this time in his life. And God says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, when Moses says, who am I? The response of God is, I will certainly be with you. And so the next time that you feel God nudging you or pushing you or encouraging you to step out and, and, and you're so readily willing to begin to say, God, but who am I? Just understand that God is telling you that I will be with you. I remember, I remember I was, man, I, I was very young in the Lord at, at, at this particular time. Probably saved maybe a year and a half. And, and, uh, and I was going to church in, in Azusa with my, my original pastor, Pastor Mike, my brother-in-law. The church that I got saved in, which was a praise chapel that was sent out of Pastor Raymond's church. And um, my mom was in Pastor Raymond's church, and my, my little sister was there, and of course my sister and brother-in-law were sent out of there. And so there I was in, in my brother-in-law's church, just growing the things of God. And uh, um, and Pastor Raymond, um, you know, had heard, you know, some things about me, and good things, not, nothing bad. And, uh, and so he, I remember he invited me. Uh, this is when we used to have Sunday morning services and Sunday night services. So we used to have service at 10 in the morning and then again at 6 in the evening every Sunday, like clockwork, every Sunday. So if you guys sometimes think, man, this is tiring. And it wasn't tiring, man. We actually had a good time. And, uh, and I remember uh, that Pastor Raymond asked me um, to come and speak on, on a Sunday evening. It was a 6 o'clock service. Here I am, maybe a year and a half saved. And it's, it's, you know, it's the full church there. And, uh, and I remember um, feeling, and, and, and to top it off, you guys know who Jack Harris is. 
he's our um, missionary to Iraq. He preached Sunday morning. And so I'm following him up and I'm just, I'm, I'm messed up. I'm like, man, what, what, what's going on here? Like, I can't do this, you know, you know, and I remember, um, Pastor Tony Diaz, um, you know, I remember sharing with him, man, I was just, I was just like, I, I, I you know, I was going to do it. I wasn't turning it down, but I was really struggling with this. And I remember Pastor Tony, um, he, he made this statement to me and it stuck with me ever since that day. And he said this, if God didn't ordain for you to be here on this Sunday night, speaking whatever it is you're going to speak, then you wouldn't be here. And so you, you got to remember that whenever you're asked, whenever, you know, you're asked to do something and, and perhaps you're stepping out of your comfort zone instead of, you know, because some of you, you know, you, you may be challenged that, you know, hey, come and give a message or come do this, come do that. And, and, and you may come to a place, you may be like, hey, man, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, or, you know, like, like when they, I don't like to lead worship at all. They know that. And sometimes I have to. And, and, you know, I just got to do it. That's not my, that's not my call. I'm not comfortable in that place. But I can have a thousand excuses, but, you know, I just go and say, okay, God, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> this is all I got, you know. And I by no means think, you know, I have the voice for that. But, hey, there, 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 there's, a, there's a need. And, and sometimes there's going to be a need. And, and I'm wondering, are, are you going to step into that need or are you going to have an excuse out of fear as to why you can't do it? Who am I? Who am I? And some of us will use this same excuse today some will 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 begin to ponder the same thought but who am i you have been wonderfully created by the hand of god and so never allow that thought to enter into your mind the enemy loves to attack your confidence and your esteem and always know that everything you do when you're, you're operating and moving in the kingdom, you're not doing it on your own. You're not doing it by yourself. When you come to a place where you rely on the Holy Spirit, right? When, when you just completely say, throw your hands up and say, look, man, I, I, I don't even know what I'm going to do. But God, I'm trusting you. Ain't that right, Janae, when you were just on your panel over there with all these ladies, you know? And, 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 and you're there and you, you have to speak. You know, you're, you're called, the limelight's on you. You know, you're part of the panel. Everybody's waiting for your answer. What are you going to say? And when you have the understanding that I don't have the words to say, I, 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 there's nothing I can say that can, can, can do anything for anybody outside of being moved under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God is telling Moses, I will certainly be with you. And so when, when you're called and you feel underqualified or, or who am I and, 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 and your esteem, you know, growing up, you've been, you've been constantly told, you know, perhaps, you know, you'll never do anything good in life. You'll never, and, and a lot of people have heard that in their lives. And instead of, you know, People holding on to the praise and to the good things. People always hold on to the bad things. We always remember the negative things that were spoken against our life. Never the positive things. And so who am I? And God says, don't worry about who you are. I will be with you. And so I want you to hold on to that thought tonight. Because... I, you know, I want you to be people without an excuse. When God calls you, when God speaks to you, when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, that you're not looking for excuses for, because excuses are always used for what? For a way to get out of something. You want to get out of work? You use an excuse. You want to get out of this or that? You use it. I wonder how many excuses have we used? When, when, when something was happening in God's kingdom and, man, we were just, we were moving, we were functioning, we were operating for the kingdom of God, and you gave some lame excuse and you weren't even walking in that excuse. Liar! <laughs> Liars! And so we want to get to a place where 
we're not using excuses. And as we go through these things, we talk about these things, we're going to look at the truth of the matter is, and, and the reality that all the excuses Moses was using, were, were using was actually a smoke screen for the truth of why he didn't want to go. And we're going to get into that in just a few moments. And then Moses says in Exodus chapter 3, verse number 13, then Moses said to God, here comes his next excuse. When I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What am I supposed to say to them? Mm. What shall I say is Moses' excuse. What is it you want me to say? These people who have been in Egypt almost 400 years, I have to come and convince them to come and follow after me. And so, God, what am I supposed to say to these people? Who is this God who sent you to us? Moses expresses his inadequacy of knowing what to say. And how many times have you been in a position where, and this is just this is just the Holy Spirit dealing with you, where God tells you, I want you to go and tell that person something. And your immediate, your immediate thought is, God, what am I supposed to say? It, it, it's somebody, and it's I especially love it when it's not. It's not your typical person that you know that you can have a conversation with. Perhaps it's somebody of a different social status than you, and, and you feel inferior, and you're looking at the situation, and you're like, man, I, I, I don't know what I can say to this person. And so God says, don't, don't worry about it. Just say that I am sent you. And so know this, that... When, when you pray, when you come before God, when you find yourself in this situation, you'll look for an excuse. But instead of giving an excuse, if you perhaps just take a moment, listen to me tonight, just take a moment and, 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 and pause and say, Holy Spirit, give me the words. You want me to speak to that person. I don't even speak their vocabulary. I'm not even on the same playing level as that individual but god you're telling me to speak and so i can't go in my own power and so lord you lead me and you you would be surprised you know if we would just step out a little bit more and and, and take these opportunities or take these chances and not rely on our own ability but rely on the power of god's spirit you're going to walk away completely blown away by what just took place in that interaction you're going to walk away from that interaction and you're going to call me or you're going to call somebody. You're going to be like, Matt, you're going to be excited. You're like, brother, you don't even know what just happened. Man, it was the craziest thing. That's what happens when you trust in God's spirit to lead you and to guide you. And you don't come to a place where I, I, I don't know what to say. None of us know what to say. We don't know what that person is going through. Sometimes it's just as simple as walking up to somebody that appears to have it all together and God saying, go talk to them. And you're saying, but I, I, I don't know what to say to them. And God would tell you to tell them that don't worry, God said everything's going to be all right. And all of a sudden that person that from the outside looks to have it all together, all of a sudden breaks down. Because internally there's so much turmoil going on and you allowed yourself to be used by the Spirit. Of God. Moses, what am I supposed to say? Let God say it for you. These are all excuses that people will, will use as to why. Because what does that do? That advances God's kingdom. Whether you plant the seed, whether you water the seed, what does the Bible say about that? That it's not your responsibility to bring the increase. The increase can only come from God alone. If you can convince somebody to get saved, somebody else can convince them not to be saved. 
But if the Holy Spirit draws a man or a woman, there's something very different about, about that relationship. We're not here to try and convince anybody of anything but to lay the facts down and let the Holy Spirit do the rest of the work. Some people hesitate to share the gospel for the same reason that Moses gave to the Lord. Because they don't know what to say. Then Moses comes up with another excuse. Exodus chapter 4 verse 1. He, then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Moses is, is looking for all of these exits, looking for all of these ways of getting out. You, you understand God is speaking directly to Moses. This is the voice of God audible, speaking into his life. And here he is with all of these different excuses. And so God says in Exodus chapter number 4, verses 2 all the way through 9, he talks about the rod that is in Moses' hand, which turns into a serpent, his own hand, which turns into into leprosy, and then the leprosy is gone. And the water which is dropped on the ground and then turns into blood. And so God is showing Moses that when they begin to challenge who I am, I've given you signs and wonders and miracles to prove who I am. <clears throat> and so today, in, in the times that we live in, we may not have a rod turning into a serpent. We may not have water turning into blood on the ground. We may not put our hand in our pocket and pull it out and it's full of leprosy and we put it back and now it's clean as a form. But we do have the word of God. We do have prophecy. We do have archaeology. We do have a lot of things that we can present we do have a lot of ways that we can give the gospel. That's what I love about, about Christianity, about the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that we are not afraid to answer the hard questions of what people call religion. Everybody else, they don't truly have a history. You look at all of these different religions and where they were birthed out of, you know, whether it be Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or, 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 or Muslims or Buddha or all of these different religions, when you try and take them back to the origin of where it started, it really crumbles. It falls apart. But when you trace back the evidence for Christianity, it stands on its own. And so I encourage you, perhaps you find yourself in a position, not everybody's going to believe what we have to say, but at least give people the facts. Give them all of the information. Give them the word of God. And then they can make their own decision from that point. Suppose they do not believe me. And Moses was used to do great and mighty things. Then in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, he comes with another excuse. Do, do you see the, the pattern here? Do you see the excuses? And, and I wonder how many times God's been trying to get your attention, and every time he's trying to get your attention, you have another excuse as to why you can't do what God is calling you to do. How about, I mean, this isn't found here, but we have a couple of people that are going to have babies. Now, don't use your baby as an excuse to not do what God has called you to do. Because others before 
you have had babies. Missionaries have had babies and continued in the mission field. And so, so we have to be careful because we can find a lot of ways to come up with excuses. You know, now all of a sudden, my friend, no, no, no. What, what's the best thing to do is to train up your child in the way of the Lord. How do you do that? Not only by discipline, but by allowing your children to be a part of the kingdom, living the kingdom, building the kingdom. I remember taking my kids everywhere. Everything we did. Trust me, I, you, I, I've always loved fellowshipping. This ain't new to me. Yeah, it's just me and my wife now, and now we can just roll and go and do what we want. But when we had all our kids, we'd be like, let's go. We going. <laughs> we going. We going. We're not looking for an excuse to not be a part of what's happening. Now, I get it. Use wisdom. If it's cold outside, you got a little baby. Hey, it's too cold. I want to take the baby out. Nobody's saying anything like that. But don't look for reasons or excuses to why you can't continue and build the kingdom of God because other things begin to happen in life. Moses in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 says this. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Moses claims that I don't speak with such great eloquence. Let me tell you what I've come to find in the kingdom. I have heard very common men, not very educated, speak under the power of the Holy Spirit and move me in such a way that the hyper charismatic, eloquent, I, I, I see it all the time. You know, I, 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 I watch a lot of things not fully through like I'll, I'll see a lot of these whether it be celebrity pastor or you know these these guys and and they got the charisma and, and they know how to speak they know how to motivate and and i'm like man there's there's no power in that there's 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 there's, there's rarely any word rarely any word and, and I know, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you can get excited for those sorts of things. You know, you hear somebody and man, they look, they look excited, man. They look good, man. Look at them preach. And, and they got this huge church and, you know, a bunch of young people and everybody's excited. Everybody's getting all crazy, but there's no substance. They're, they're eloquent with their tongue. They, they know how to speak. You know, they got charisma. They've taken classes on, on, on how to speak to crowds, you know. When all you really need is the word of God and some time in prayer and saying, God, I need you to speak to me. God, give me your word so that I can give it to your people so that they can be encouraged. They can be moved. They can be convicted. They can be motivated. They can be drawn closer to you after hearing what your word says. Meanwhile, jumping Johnny is over there full of charisma, you know, giving this message that isn't even biblically based. Oh, eloquence means nothing, my friend. It doesn't matter what grade you went to. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter if you had a learning disability and, and you have a hard time retaining information. God's not looking for your eloquence. So if that's your excuse tonight, if, if you have this, this excuse that, you know, I just, I just, I just can't, Put it together, man. You're not relying on God's Holy Spirit. When you rely on the Holy Spirit of God, I'm telling you, something else just, just begins to happen. Sometimes you'll be you'll be done delivering a message or speaking, and you're like, man, I don't even know what I said. Not that it, anything was bad at all, but you were just being led by God. Like, like God was just giving things to you. And you're just speaking. You, you don't have to be eloquent. Now, it doesn't hurt to be eloquent for those of you that are smart and, and you understand books well and you read, you retain information. Man, I, I love John MacArthur, right? He's very eloquent in how he speaks. And the dude, you know, is, is just, he, he's amazing. Uh, anointed by God, speaks the word of God, very eloquent. There's other guys that aren't very eloquent. They're very raw. 
But nonetheless, God's not looking for you and I to be eloquent in the way that we speak. And so God would tell Moses, you know what, don't worry about that. Uh, many scholars believe that Moses stuttered when he, when he says, I was slow to speak, you know. And so he found that, you know, he has all of these different excuses as to why he can't walk and accomplish what God has called him to do. And so then finally, we come to Moses' final um, excuse, right? <laughs> and, 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 and all of these different things that he was coming to brings us to this place. Finally, Moses gets, gets real. Finally, he gets honest. And he says, please send someone else. I don't want to go. At the end of the day, Moses finally comes to the place. After, after he gives an excuse and God gives a response to every excuse. Because when God speaks to you and you begin to have excuses, God will have an answer for everything that you have to say. And you can't run from the call of God. I mean, you can, but God really wants you to walk in obedience to his word. And that's what ultimately we are here to do. See, God's going to ask you to do some things that you're not going to want to do. Because they're going to be sacrificial. It's going to require a lot from you. It's going to require you to maybe get rid of some things, to maybe lose some friends, to maybe change some of your leisure time up, because you're going to have to rely and trust in God a little bit more. And so Moses says that, God, that you would just simply send someone else. And I begin to think, like, what are some of the reasons for why? I mean, Moses may have had some good reasons for why he didn't want to go. Closing here the next couple of moments, but listen to what I have to say. Remember, Moses was in Egypt. Remember, he left because he murdered. Remember, he, he, he murdered somebody there. And so then Moses flees, and, and now he finds himself on the back of the mountain, tending to his father-in-law's flocks, Mary, just, just living the life now, right? Living, living comfortable. I mean, everything's in place there. Plenty of livestock has his wife raising his family. And then God comes and knocks on the door of his heart and challenges him to not only go back to Egypt, but to go back to the place where perhaps he may be wanted. Now Moses is thinking, all of my security, everything that I've, that I've done here, everything that, that, that has come into my life, and now you want me to go back to this place where perhaps I may be on Egypt's ten most wanted. They may be looking for me. And so Moses has all of these reservations, perhaps, as to why he doesn't want to go. And he's giving excuse after excuse after excuse. And then finally he says, God, can you just please send somebody else? And then the Bible says something very interesting. It says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. So that simply states this, is that when, when God begins to speak to your life, when he begins to challenge you, and he begins to, 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 to bring you to a place where he wants you to step into something more. He wants you to walk into something deeper. And you have all these excuses as to why you can't. At the end of the day, the truth and the reality is, is that you are walking in disobedience to the Spirit of God, and the anger of God will be kindled against your life. See, when you come to Jesus Christ, you are not your own anymore. You don't belong to yourself anymore. We belong to God. He is our Father in heaven, and He has a plan and a purpose for your life, and we need to walk in obedience to that plan. Sometimes that plan is hard. You're going to look for ways around it. But when the tire meets the road and God begins to truly speak into your life, it's in that moment you need to say, God, I need to hear your voice and say, God, as difficult as it's going to be, as many excuses as I've had as to why I can't do it, God, I hear your voice and I will walk in obedience. And so I wonder, what is God speaking to you about? What has God been speaking to you about? And think of all the different excuses that you have brought up to say why you can't do that. 
if we are going to grow the kingdom, if we're going to advance the kingdom, if we're going to be effective, if we're going to be blessed by God, the Bible says that obedience is greater than sacrifice. And at the end of the day, what is God telling you? I don't know what God's telling you. I don't know exactly what he's speaking into your life. But what are those, those little seeds that have been planted in your heart? That you, once in a while, feel a nudge of excitement. And perhaps you hear God's spirit. You know, we just came out of conference. Conference time is usually a time of, of, of a lot of, man, excitement. And, 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 you know, just everything that's happening. And, man, I want to do something. I want to do something. And then I wonder how many times, you know, you just start coming up with excuses as to why you can't do the things that God has spoken to you about, even in those moments. And so tonight, as we close in this place, excuses are a part of life. We're going to use them. Many times we're going to use them to get out of what we don't want to do. But with God, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Sometimes we're afraid, I get it. Sometimes we, we don't know what the future holds, I get it. And, and, and we'll come up with excuses. But, but at the end of the day, when it's just you and God, and all your excuses have been used up, and the Lord is speaking to you in that moment, my charge to you, my challenge to you, or God's charge, God's challenge to you is this. Enough is enough. Enough is enough with the playing of the games and, you know, saying why you can't, why you can't. And now start walking in the call that God has called you to. Start walking in that call. Begin to truly understand what it is to be in God's will. We need every one of us to walk in the place that God has called us to. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. And now I'm going to give an opportunity tonight, as we always do. Always remember that every every time you minister the Word of God, always give that opportunity for somebody to give their heart to Jesus. Give their heart to the Lord. Because that's where it all starts. That's where it all started for every one of us. That's where our new life began. Amen? Amen. When we were finally at that place and we heard that message and we are like, man, I need Jesus. Some of us, it was ugly. It was messy. Vocals everywhere, crying everywhere. Nonetheless, how it happened, man, that, that was the beginning. What a wonderful thing that was in our life and we always want to get that opportunity. So, perhaps, um, Somebody may be watching online, and uh, you may not be born again tonight. Jesus Christ may not be Lord of your life. And so it is our responsibility to give you that opportunity. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. You don't give your life to Jesus once, and then you go live like a devil, and then you just think, man, I can do whatever I want because I'm saved. You got it twisted. You got it twisted. So perhaps you're a backslider. Perhaps you've turned your back on God and, 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 and you're not pursuing Him. You're not pursuing the kingdom. And tonight maybe you need to make a U-turn and come back to the Lord. I want to I lead you in a prayer tonight. And uh, that prayer is simply this, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing He died upon the cross, rose on the third day, and today sits at the right hand of the Father. And it's simply by, by confessing with your mouth, but believing in your heart that Jesus is Lord. So if that's you tonight, I want you to simply say this, Heavenly Father. Tonight I come before you, Lord, and I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I need a Savior. And so Jesus, tonight I invite you to come into my heart 
that you would forgive me of all of my sins, God. I believe that when you died upon that cross, that you nailed my sins to that cross, and that I would be forgiven forevermore. I ask you tonight, fill me with your Holy Spirit, God, so that I may live for you, not only today, but all the days of my life. I ask this tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Let's give those Amen. Amen. Maybe tonight you're in this place and you've had excuses. You've had excuses as to why you can't do what God's called you to do. You, you came up with every, every single reason, right? But at the end of the day, God's word says this. If you do not obey my word, my anger will be kindled against you. And so let's close tonight in the word of prayer as we just seal this. Um, I believe that we've heard God's word. I believe that we don't want to be a people that are full of excuses. But that we would be people that say, raise our hand and say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. Whatever needs to be done, here am I, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we conclude this service tonight. We thank you tonight for the power of your word and for the power of your Holy Spirit. Because, God, we want to be a people that don't come to you with excuses as to why we can't do what you called us to do, but that we would be a people that would lift our hands and say, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Use me. We ask this tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Come on. Amen.